morning welcome to physics 431 if you like just quickly switch on your camera so again we can see there are actually live people in this class morning so then let's switch off because i have a little program for today Make sure you click a switch on PHY431 Spanier as always. I realize not many make use of my office hour. Please do so. If there are leftover questions from the lecture, that's the whole point to trigger questions. And like always, I encourage you when I demonstrate something to open, just open your mic and ask. Let's just see where we are on our uh, plan. So I sprinkled some things in here. Today I ask you to read up on 3.1. We start now to talk about potentials. One could summarize what we did so far as a quick repeat through the uh, basics of electrostatics. And I gave you two homeworks. The second one you handed in. It's graded while we speak. The third one is due on Thursday. And I will give you a couple of comments on the questions. Uh, in a moment. I promise you I will hand you a test exam to uh, familiarize yourself with the format of the tests, which we have scheduled for the 1st of October. I mentioned it's not completely clear in what format it's uh, slowly uh, materializing, and I will tell you more when I hand out actually the test exam. It will be uh, well prepared. There should be no surprise. And uh, as you can see, I expect we will have a homework for, <clears throat> which I will give out again on Thursday, for Thursday next week then. 
Now, let me just uh, step on into one of my clicker questions. And instead of just asking you for taking your attendance, I just re asked you a question from last time. So just make sure your clicker works. <clears throat> just try to answer this one, which is which object has the lower electrostatic potential energy? And we discussed this last time, and it should be really no question at all. As I say, this is make sure the clickers work all of us now. So I see 36 participants. I expect at least 35 responses. I didn't get them all yet. As we discussed last time, a uniformly charged sphere shell is the one with the lower electrostatic potential energy. And this is one way to explain why charges tend to drift to the farthest out uh, position on a conductor. Okay, or on a, on a shell, on a uh, sphere, sorry. So by now you may have asked in my previous table, uh, it also lists quizzes. There are these quizzes actually. I'm answering this question right now because now that we have checked that the clickers work, I can uh, ask you five questions in review of what we discussed so far. And it's practically the same as clickers. The only difference is and it's very subtle that now I'm not giving you points for the incorrect answer. So the correct answer still gets you two points and the incorrect answer zero points. These are questions you can answer in 30 seconds, but I give you one minute so everybody has a chance to really answer these questions. So if you're ready, I start with the first question. And they have varying degrees of difficulty, I assume for you. Nevertheless, you should all know what it is about. So this is a simple configuration of charges. What is the electric force on the negative charge in the center due to the four charges placed at a distance A, as you see in this plot, along the X axis and Y axis. And K I define in this case as one over four by epsilon zero. And so there are A, B, C, D, and E answers. Please look at the slides. I cannot guarantee that everything comes well through if you look at your phone. So what is the, the electric force here on this charge? And start a little bit late. As I said, you have 60 seconds. So in this case, I'm not going to answer the uh, question until we are through these five questions. But of course, if you still have doubts or why you didn't answer uh, the uh, ask after the test. So the next question, which of the following cases could actually occur above and below a sheet of surface charge? And here you really have to look at the different sch uh, schematic.
And Janssen in this case. Oops. Is B. And again, if you have questions, we go back and answer them later. And the next question is this A neutral copper sphere has a spherical hollow in the center, a charge plus Q is placed in the center. What is the potential on the inner shell of radius A of the cavity? it up D and this question is numerical a metal sphere of radius R is surrounded by the thick metal shell that carries a net charge of 8 nanocoulomb then a charge of minus 5 nanocoulomb is placed on the inner sphere of radius R what is the charge on the outer sphere in electrostatic equilibrium Okay, and the answer in this case was, is 3 nanocolon. Okay, and here's the final question. I promised five. A parallel capacitor is attached to a battery, which maintains a constant voltage difference V between the capacitor plates. While the battery is attached, the plates are pulled apart. The electric energy stored in the capacitor increases, decreases.
and the amount of space. That's it. And of like this. So if there are leftover questions, you can quickly address them. Yeah, totally. Maybe I'll see you at school. Yeah, maybe. If not, I would uh, give you uh, some comments on the homework. Let me see if I can actually display. Yeah. I do actually have a question. Um, yeah. I... I don't remember if it was the second or third question, but one where you had the neutral outer shell and the potential depended upon the outer radius. Um, right. I, I did not understand that. Could you explain that, please? Okay, let me see. They asked, what is the potential on the inner shell, right? Yes. Yeah, we discussed this in, let me see, I have to stop here. Uh, quickly look at it there you go uh, make sure you increase the, the screen yes um the potential at infinity is zero and we discussed if you calculate the potential oh no, you know for example you know the field you come from the outside and you start integrating inward, right? Okay. Uh, so I wrote these different integrals down here. So this is B here. Did you say R, you know, already? Or... <laughs> no, I, I was at the Eureka okay. moment just clicked. <laughs> okay, okay. So A and B is here. As you come from the outside, so you go from infinity to B, that's the first one. So you get a value, no? This is just the potential at B, which is KQ over B practically, no? Mm -hmm. And this is a shell, what does it mean? It is an equipotential. A conductor is an equipotential. The potential here is the same potential here, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the short answer. Sorry. Can you record it? Can I what? Record the lecture. Oh, record. Yeah, I want to start recording after the quiz. That's right. Thank you. Thanks. So. The potential in B is coming from the outside. It's just KB, K, KQ over B is, this is an ugly potential. And wherever I am on this metal, I have the same potential. No? I could continue integrating inward. So the next one would be from B to A. And as we have shown last time, this is actually zero here, no? there. And then, then I go further inward. Now, if I put a point charge, it's not good to go all the way to zero. Say, I go to some R, continue. And as you can see, I get two terms here. I get one uh, K Q over A, and I get one K Q over R, which tells you if I'm at A, these two do not contribute. And indeed the total, which is the sum of all of them is K Q over B. So even mathematically, if I were to write down the total expression all the way inward, if I then go back and calculate what happens at A, these two are gone. Clear? Yes, thank you. Good. Any other question to any of the other questions? Okay. <clears throat> Homework, yeah, I wanted to actually uh, quickly uh, pop it up so we can have a quick look. I'll give you a couple of hints. Uh, there you go. I guess you cannot see it yet. Mm. 
increase this or decrease it so you see more of the screen. Can you see it? Yeah, I should. Okay, so the first one. No, I think I popped the wrong one. I think I popped up the wrong one. I'm sorry. So the first question is about the cavity. So the first one is about cavity, the thing we just discussed a little bit. Um, more detail, but so there I have not much to say. For the coax cable, it may be an unusual way to phrase the answer, but if you remember the calculation of the field or the potential depended on the length, which in the end canceled out. Now, if you calculate this as the uh, capacitance or as asked the energy here, you may realize you are left over with the length along Z because the integration of Z now is undefined. You have to integrate over the length. So DZ prime integral means you are left with the Z dependence and you just divide by the Z dependence. So you get uh, z over z and uh, w over z as answer here uh, the question to express this in uh, quantities the radii and whatever constant of nature means you play with your answer until you can substitute everything you know to end up just as a expression in terms of a b and one of the constants as epsilon zero And then question three, this is to give you a little bit more of an interesting context, how I like to start X. For example, led to a particular picture of the electron uh, being in principle discussed how to calculate the electrostatic potential energy of a uniformly charged sphere. In this case, I asked you to use the field. You remember you can also start from the charge distribution. If it's uniformly charged, then it's one half integral rho uh, and then B and then integrated over the volume. But uh, I ask you to start with the field, which we figured out last time is the far easier way. Once you know the field, it's only one step. Once you have the energy, then I put it in the context. Uh, the electron has a rest mass. At this point, you may or may not know what it means. But it's, let's say some zero point energy of mc square. And uh, you assume that the electron is such a sphere, like I said, it's a classical picture. And now you can calculate what is the corresponding radius of the electron, because you have, of course, gotten from above the radial dependence. And now you can solve by having this. The electron mass, you will have to look it up, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, very small. Uh, as a hint, the radius you will get here is in the order of the proton radius. So this may give you an idea. This is a very classical example, and it's really just to recapitulate one last time how to calculate classically the superposition of forces. So I've chosen two identical small spheres that have been charged up. And there is, of course, a dependence, a simple force uh, vector addition here to uh, write down the relationship and from that uh, to um, solve for the charge on each sphere. The second one is just a slight complication. The geometry becomes a little bit more uh, involved. In this case, assume the charge which you got from up there, you plug it in 
yes, I formulated this as dependent questions, but uh, you first, of course, give the formula that you used to calculate this, and there you will find the subtlety. The answer is a product of two trigonometric functions of the angle, and that means it is not straightforward to actually solve this. So the final step you will have to do numerically or guessing. And so what I tell you here is that if you do everything right, the angle is between 10 and 20 degrees. Of course, I ask you to find the exact angle, say to one digit uh, after, or to one digit after the uh, 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 dot, meaning uh, get some answer. Uh, by experimenting with the uh, calculator, by iteratively, numerically solving it. So that's my warning there. Don't be uh, discouraged if you get some product of some sine and some tangents. And then finally, that's uh, the potential of a uniformly charged sphere. And in this case, you calculate it according like I mentioned before, the more involved way. And uh, you integrate this out. We started this in class. And it's really to have done it once and uh, understand the subtleties of doing that. And then we first doing it along the z-axis. And then in the end, finding that because we talk about the uniformly charged sphere, the z-axis uh, dependence is not an explicit z-axis dependence. The same trick in principle you already applied to get the uh, general form of the electric field and potential for the dipole in the previous question, in the previous homework. There, by the way, you also found, this was one open question, that the curl of the electric field of a dipole is zero. And it is surprising because the field lines seem to curl around but the subtlety in this case is we have a, a source and a sink in this case. So whatever you curl, it is compensated and it, it does not continue behind the charge. So everything ends, starts and ends in a charge. Are there questions up to this point? Yeah, so. Thursday again midnight would be the uh, time for the uh, homework. And now let me try to get back to the slides. Where did I leave them? So then I would like, like to come back and ask you the regular click clicker question, which is just to check your knowledge against what you have read up on and have a discussion starter. So the Poisson equation tells you that the second derivative of a potential is minus rho over epsilon zero. If the charge density throughout some volume is zero, what else must be true throughout this volume? V is zero, the electric field is zero, both V and E must be zero, and none of the above is true. So again, in this case, you get your two points if you answer correctly, and one point you participate. As you turn and give me a kiss on my lips, and I let go of my hand and ran into the, into like fucking recess. And I was like, yo. In 30 seconds, it's probably true. I will stop this. Ten seconds to go. Okay. 
And the answer is none of the above is true. What is missing? What is missing? Why is this not enough? In other words, we are missing some boundary conditions here. We can have a field free zone. We can have uh, no charges in the region, but it doesn't mean the field is here. We had these examples. And it doesn't mean the potential is uh, zero. If the second derivative is given, you need to know also the boundary conditions. A region of space contains no charge. What can I say about B in the interior? And now it should be pretty clear. Not much, there are many possibilities. V is zero everywhere inside, or V is constant inside. To all the ladies in the place. Now, in this case, the boundary condition is given, and we know it has to smoothly match it. But, uh, sorry, the boundary conditions are not given, sorry. <laughs> we know it has to smoothly match it, that's all we know. And so, since they are not given, we do not know much. There are many possibilities for V for R. So, the same thing. We said on the previous slide. So finally, a region of space contains no charges. The boundary has V equals zero everywhere. What can I say now about V and the interior? To all the ladies in the place. So I hope this question really turned out to be just, are you still awake? Because now we have indeed all the ingredients we need, no? And then the uniqueness theorem tells us, in this case, the answer is, let me just mark it up, we have seen it already, that a VR has to be zero everywhere inside. It cannot have, it cannot develop extrema inside. And, uh, let me summarize on the next slide, indeed, what we discussed. V has no local maxima or minima inside. They have to be on the surrounding boundary. And so, in the previous last question, obviously, there was none. It was zero. So it cannot develop one inside. Another way to say that is uh, V is boring smooth and continues everywhere. No. If you have a ping pong ball, it has to smooth and reel all off from whatever is going on. If you think of it as a two-dimensional problem, in a two-dimensional way to formulate this problem is, as you have read up, I hope, to think of it as a rubber sheet that you put over the boundaries of a cotton box. And you cut out some boundary. In uh, 3D, it's more complicated complicated, but what holds true, and it's a nice method to start uh, solving a pot potential numerically is that the average of the potential over a surrounding sphere in 3D or a circle in 2D or just the left and right point in 1D gives you actually the point in the middle of R, the center point. No? So you can write this down, V from R is 1 over 4 pi R square, and then Integrate out that the sphere with radius r around r, vdr. And um, this allows you to iteratively get the potential. Well, you, you know the boundary conditions. You don't know what's going inside, what is going on inside. So you sprinkle some gases into the volume and then you calculate the average and you start replacing successively the uh, sprinkle values by the averages 
So by construction, doing an average, can you start smoothing it out and you iteratively make your way towards a potential that indeed describes what's going on smoothly inside and matches from where you started from the boundary. And then finally, is unique, that's the uniqueness uh, theorem. The illusion of the Laplace equation, which means we said uh, the row of epsilon to zero, just as a reminder in the Poisson equation, is uniquely determined if V is specified on the boundary surface around the volume. So this is all very abstract in principle. It has a lot of consequences. But you like to start abstract to have the most general formulation of the properties. Um, to just have a quick look at the averaging procedure. That comes with it as an example. And I make you uh, give you a couple of uh, commands. You may have gone through it. If you take a sphere, oops. this is the Z axis here. I put a charge up here, outside the sphere. I put the sphere by the construction at the center, it doesn't matter. We are going now into a volume. It's charge free where we sit, the charge is out there. And now I wanna get the potential down here at the center by integrating here over my Okay, this is a shell. By integrating over this shell. <clears throat> and there are immediate subtleties which make this less abstract when, when uh, I bear to uh, calculate this. So integration over, the, integration over the surface means, of course, I have some point here, which is our field point. So if I'm careful again setting this up, this would be the vector R as before the vector that points to the charge that's our r prime and so if i write them out r prime is simply zz prime the vector along z r is any idea <coughs> r is now it goes radially out but it runs on the surface, whatever the radius is, I call it now capital R. Point is it runs on the radius of the sphere R. And we know how to write down the potential. It has to be written down in terms of the relative vector between the two. But the dependence in the end is of course an R or for the field R square. So the R is just the square root of the square sum. Oh, in this case, this is the square. So I don't need to write the square root. R square plus Z square. And then we are left with the dot product between the two of them minus two R Z cosine. And here's my first point. No, if you look at this, in fact, it is actually symmetric in a way in R and C. So if I have something expressed in proportionality of one over R prime, in principle, if I flip the definition around, if you make the field point, the observance point, and the observance point, the field point, the actual dependence doesn't change because it is symmetric in R and Z. Huh? So if I do my averaging now, to get actually the potential at the center, the center here. By the way, what dependence do we expect? No, we express this along. Or see it along the you know, the potential is one over four pi r square. If you remember my formula, no, it's the averaging over the sphere, so I have to divide by the area. 
and now I have to integrate out. Let's write it one more time, VDA. Over the sphere here. <clears throat> then it ends up in KQ. Oh, K is the typical one over four pi epsilon zero. Then we are left with the four pi over R square. And here it comes. The R itself is constant. It runs on the surface. I have this d cosine theta integral. And I have the d phi over two pi. Then I have, like I said, the R square, which is fixed. And then now it's divided by the full expression here, r squared plus c squared minus rz cosine theta. Now you can do substitution. I have to integrate over the cosine theta here. Practically, the phi gives me 2 pi. So if you look at the expression you get here, you see if it's still in the range. Yep, I have still space here. So you get an expression kq over 2rz and then this brings it up and you have to do it with a minus one and a plus one here on this term you find this is one uh, z plus r term and then minus z minus r term if you've done your homework, this is a similar integral you have to solve to do the uniformly charged sphere. And this is kq over c. So this is the potential due to the charge at the center of the sphere here. So what happens if I now take the charge and I put it actually inside? So that's not, not anymore what we discussed so far, because we said we want to solve the Laplace equation. And this is, of course, a straightforward example, showing that the potential is non-zero when you are in a region where the Laplace applies. The solution is a finite one here, KQ will see. Nevertheless, putting the charge into my sphere, of course, that's uh, not really uh, Laplace equation. But we're talking averaging here, and the averaging indeed works in this case too. So what changes if I put actually the charge inside? And the hint was already when I looked at this and told you it's actually symmetric. If I put the charge inside, in this case, if Q is inside, In this case, the z which I run is smaller than r. And so in my expression here, z minus r, I practically run is negative c. So I flip this around because this flips around as I turn the integration around. So that uh, z minus r here turns into R minus Z. And no surprise now, the answer we get here is KQ over R. So actually, oh, make sure you can see this. KQ over R is the inside. And so if we, have a case where we have a charge inside and outside with my averaging method. In fact, in the end, I get the total potential everywhere. That superposition principle, no. Then I add this one to this one and I have covered the region. Questions? Questions? Okay, in fact, <clears throat> solving the Laplace equation, if it's a spherical semantic problem is actually kind of trivial. It reduces to a one dimensional problem. 
Why is this? Because we have an R dependence, radial dependence. And if I write the Laplace equation in uh, spherical coordinates accordingly to match the symmetry here, so let's just write it down, solve this for a spherical symmetric problem. Now you just open Griffiths, or you remember you are uh, second derivative, this goes this one over r square d dr and then r square d dr applied to v from r. That's what I mean by only dependent on r, not vector on r, no? But this is practically a one-dimensional problem again. And I can straightforwardly solve this by successive integration. So if I integrate this once, oh, I will go now step by step. First integration, of course, gives me a constant also. R square dv dr is a constant. I did one integration. So if I do the second integration, then I, of course, have not to forget that I have a 1 over r square here. And in fact, it stays. So if I integrate this once more, and I take another integration constant a here, this was the constant a plus b, I have the full solution. And then again, why is this not really the full answer? Because I'm left to, fill, to also get an answer for A and B. And the way to get there is now from any given boundary conditions. Nevertheless, if you look at it, what you see here is, of course, the potential of a uniformly charged sphere outside the sphere, for example. No? And so we know what has to happen. If you go to infinity, it has to go to zero. That tells us this B is a nuisance here. <laughs> we have to get rid of it. The B is zero to get this to infinity. And the next argument would be, how do I find A by units or by the condition that I have enclosed a charge, a uniformly charged sphere. And that's the total charge in the spheres inside. Once I have done this, then I have a unique solution. That's the solution. Questions? Yeah. In fact, one could have uh, spelled out the uniqueness even for the electric field now. So of course, only one more step now. The average electric field over the spherical so surface due to charges outside the sphere is equal to the field at the center of the sphere. But we knew this already. But it comes straightforwardly out here, no? I uh, take the step up to here, and the only next step, of course, is I know the relationship between the electric field and the potential. But if I plug something unique in here, and I take the derivative, you get, of course, now your kq over, from the previous example, c square or r square for this. Questions? If not, I'll try to revise my slides now. Okay, we discussed this. Unfortunately, it wants to run one more time soon. Okay. No questions. Then let me ask you a question. 
So if you put a test charge at the center of this cube of charges, could it be in stable equilibrium? Yes, no, or it depends. We had similar problems. Maybe we calculated the resulting force at the center. And if you calculate the force, in other words, is there a resulting force or not? That keeps it stable. I stopped this at five to go. The answer is no. So why no? Any idea? Isn't there like an outlet in the center of each side? Is there a? At the center of each side, if, if okay, so at the dead center, if there's a charge cube placed at this cube, and then I flicked it in any given direction, isn't it going to be pulled towards the center of the side that it's, I guess, pushed it towards? Mm. Pushed would be a better word. In terms of, ink, does it get pulled? So if you put it in the middle and you would now draw all the force vectors the question is, do they cancel each other out, no? Would be before you put it on one side. So is there a resulting force to pull it to one side? No. It looks like not, no. But there's one problem is uh, discussing this in terms of force uh, because the force is actually following the electric field in this point, no? So now you try to visualize the electric field in this point. How does the field actually look if you have equal charges? Yeah, we, we look at the field of, uh, uh, of two charges. Can you still see my screen? Oh, if I have two positive charges, you know, I'm thinking of them as little spheres. But just to give you an indication, no? the field went apart. Uh, can you see it? Do you remember the uh, dipole drawing where the dipole is actually two equal charges? So instead of going from one charge to the other, in between these charges, it pushes out. Another argument one likes to use is Gauss, Gauss's law. How would I argue with Gauss's law? In principle, the same. I have to have this drawing in mind. To produce a, a stable equilibrium, I need a minimum in the middle to begin with, right? And so Gauss's law tells me these field lines cannot end up in a in a point. We cannot have less go in than out in terms of field lines. But as you just saw, if you visualize, try to visualize the 3D, it would all pop out away from the center point. So it cannot work you do not get them to actually create a, a minimum in the middle. But leaving all of this aside, what we just discussed, namely, they can just not be uh, an extrema inside of this uh, setup, which is surprising, no? But if you have these equal charges, the potential is well-defined on the sides. And inside, we cannot have any uh, minimum or maximum. Now, in this case, 
it means just you will not be able to uh, have this ping pong ball. Let's try to retrace this to 2D, but 2D is dangerous because in 2D it may actually work. So this is a true three-dimensional problem. And if you just we had to talk in analog in 2D, this would be trying to uh, put uh, a minimum in the middle, but if at all, it would be a, a subtle point. And any ping pong ball you try to place would roll off to the side. But we don't have to concern us with details because now we know there cannot be an extreme main site. So the surprising mm, question is, but this is exactly how you saw probably already a crystal structure. And if you place charges around a crystal, uh, obviously it holds together. Yeah, this mm, this holds in general too. That you cannot create, in fact, in general, an electrostatic trap. That's called Earnshaw's theorem. You cannot trap charges by placing charges. So it's more uh, general than my example here. So why does a crystal still hold together? Any question? Uh, any? Any idea? Why does a crystal hold together? We just charge it in certain locations. Now the answer is beyond this lecture. The answer is it's not electrostatics alone, it's quantum mechanics now. It's not given just by the electrostatics. The same way you run into trouble if you try to explain the hydrogen atom just in terms of electrostatic or electrodynamics, if you want, electrostatics. Okay. That as a warning uh, to take what you learn here into context somewhere else. Okay, and uh, just to ensure you, yes, one can build, of course, traps, but not by just placing charges. In fact, these are dynamic traps. What you do is you have a field that changes in time. Here, as you can see, these are electrodes and they change actually the field direction at a high frequency. And I'm not telling you more about this at this point. But you should be able to understand them as we go along in this lecture. Then there was a second theory and a straightforward question one can formulate out of this is uh, two very strong capacitors are well separated. And now I'm adding, oops, where are my wires? And I'm now adding wires. Just a second, I have to report. <laughs> My wires are gone. Yeah, that was a flop. <laughs> you know what? I report anyhow. So I have answered it. So I connected these capacitors with two thin contacting wires. And one wire goes, and you saw it now, it goes between these two plates, and one goes outside. So is this. And now you get a freebie. Is this uh, stable? And the answer is come on, no. But why no? Why no? That's maybe not so easy to take the abstract theory and actually apply the reasoning here. Any, any idea? Now the simplification of the theorem 
number two, uh, which is on the electric field in conductors in an area, maybe or maybe not surrounded by another conductor, is uh, if the charge is summed up to zero in a conductor, then it is zero. And zero means zero, meaning they will neutralize. They will not stay apart, right? So in this case, uh, just think of it redrawn. That's what I tried on this slide. You uh, redrew, if you redraw them, now it may even intuitively look uh, unnatural because each in each of these contactors, you have an equipotential. An equipotential is you have no separate charges. So these charges can be anywhere at any time without any, uh, spa without spending any energy. So they will of course neutralize because the sum over the charges in this conductor is zero and then zero means zero and then there is no charge separation. So that's a trivial form of the second theory. So that doesn't work. So two very strong capacitors are well separated. If they are connected by one thin conducting wire as shown and it is not shown and I have to indicate the wire. The wire goes from this plus Q here to this minus Q here. So the two innermost capacitor plates are connected to each other. Is this situation electric, electrostatic? Is this an electrostatic equilibrium? We could ask, or oh, it's stable, physically stable. And in this case, the answer is yes. And why is this? Because now, if I redraw the situation, you have this situation. You have indeed placed these charges as overcount on the left side of negative charges, and on the right side as overcount of positive charges, and they stay where they are. And now you move them towards the inner block, say, or the inner uh, plates. It doesn't matter. The line only ensures in principle that uh, the charges can move throughout this setup from the plate on the left side to the right side. But we discussed this before, that's a different situation. Oh, this is what we call the polarization. Hello? Polarization, no? <clears throat> I put negative charges on the left side of a conductor. I put positive charges on the right side of a conductor. So I polarize the charges in the conductor in the middle. I induce negative charges on the right and positive charges on the left. Ah, this is one step too fast. And the uh, example I wanted to give you now is just in follow up to this discussion here. I have now uh, worked out a little bit further a spherical symmetric problem, namely a uniformly charged sphere. A uniformly charged sphere, by now you know, of course, cannot be a conductor. A conducting sphere. So uniformly charged. But this is non conducting. In other words, whenever you encounter problems now, the possibilities have multiplied by two. You first have to convince yourself what we are talking about and then understand the dynamics based, say, on the theorems or now building up the intuition what happens in a conductor versus what happens in an isolator. And so if I want to calculate this field, I, of course, want to know it, uh, the potential out and then field outside and inside.
let's start outside. <clears throat> In principle, we have uh, done it just right now, but just to make it really clear what I would do. And now I do remind you also, there's another way of writing the uh, second derivative, no? Which sometimes makes it easier to guess the answer right there. So in general, this is minus rho of epsilon zero. And so I should have not written right away zero. This is true for the outside. Outside, there's no charge. So this is zero. <clears throat> Since we now know we want to calculate in both places, let me take this off. And we know the solution now. And here you may see it. And as I discussed, the boundary condition Number one was at infinity is zero. And the other one is, it should describe a point charge. Where A becomes KQ. KQ is the total charge. Total charge is So inside, <clears throat> now the differential equation looks the same. Inside, the only difference is, of course, it has to read as minus rho of epsilon zero. And this is a constant. So how do I get the second derivative of a function to be a constant? Oh, I found I'll, I'll get straight to the point. I found take it r square and do it uh, two derivatives, then it should be zero. So in general, I could write, of course, c r square plus some proportionality r plus uh, d. <clears throat> Let's call this E because I call it the extra here. If you go successively now through the uh, derivatives, we are of course going to lose this in the next step. And then we again want to apply the boundary conditions. The boundary condition would be that at R equal R, you have a matching with what's going on up here on the outside. And the second derivative has to be a constant, which I wrote here already. So second V is constant. This doesn't work if, if you carry around this you try this out by yourself. So instead of applying those successively, I shorten our discussion by saying it should look like something like CR squared plus D. <clears throat> you will see otherwise you don't get this matching to work and then it falls out. You get rid of the E. So if I do this, if I do the second derivative here, this is straightforward, but instead of doing it this uh, way I, uh, on the previous example, let's just look at this here. So you see, we just take this twice down here. And here it's a factor of two, this, the first derivative, and then you divide actually TR dependence out. So you get this as 2C plus 4C, you know? And this is minus rho of absolute. Yeah. And this gives us C. We're left with D, 
the D we get out of the matching. No? So the answer here was B is zero. A is KQ. To make this really potential, that vanishes. We discussed it in the previous example. B has to be zero. A is our KQ. So KQ over R equal our expression on this side. And from this, we find B. So we have solved it. We find CD. Now I'm not writing this explicitly down. You find your D and your C, and you compare it to our calculations in the previous lectures. Is this really the form of the potential we got before? Just um, the methodology now was a different one. We started with a differential equation. We solved the differential equation. We use the boundary conditions here. And that means whatever we got here, that's the unique result. questions up to this point. So this is what it is all about. And then we are going to use this now. That's really the lead up to solve other problems. It requires so to uh, become more flexible in how to solve them. Because as you know, the first thing on a differential equation solution, if it's not a standard differential equation is to have a good guess. So I do not, you don't need to answer right away because I want to introduce you to the, the problem, but the drawing is nice and I would have to clean here to now explain what's going on here. Now we want to solve different configurations in regions where the potential is known in some places, the boundaries and play some charges. So in this case, it's a plane, it's an infinite plane, but I only show you a piece of it. And we have along the z-axis again, place the charge somewhere up here. I think I need to uh, go out of the slides actually, so you can see the full whiteboard. If you try to answer, I come back to it. It has no time or running at this point. So don't worry. So we have this charge up here and somewhere here as arbitrary as I just did is our point. There you go. Maybe we want to evaluate the potential arbitrary somewhere, but this is of course V is AV from R here. So, of course, in our setup, this is the direction R here, as before. This is a distance D up here. And the plane itself, that's a nice boundary condition, is grounded, which I indicate with this little symbol here. So that's voltage zero, that's our reference plane. So this charge is above this grounded infinite plane. What is the potential in the region above the plane? So that's important. We wanna know this where Z is greater zero, greater equal, equal is. It's important that we agree on the region where we actually try to find the Q. Now, this plus Q up there will probably induce somehow 
a negative charge down here. And the problem may be obvious. I'm just sprinkling the idea behind here. It's good to do this with a simple example. But the point is it can become quite complicated if you have some uh, configuration of charges sitting up here, what's going on down here. We don't care a priori because we have now developed a method how to address it. We of course know in general that the potential must be the potential and some potential of the minus without really knowing how the charge is placed. We know we have to solve our Poisson equation, plus equation, we sit in a feel-free room. For this, it's good to write the boundary conditions down. So the boundary What is a good boundary condition? A good boundary condition is, of course, just taking what is given. V is zero at Z equals zero. What else? We're talking point charges here. V goes to zero for Z goes to infinity, you know, as we move away down the, up the roof, this should really disappear like we expect some one over Z dependence probably. We can also expect the R dependence here, the actual dependence in our potential. You know? We again will formulate this as R, the relative distance between the charge and the actual field point that we measure. Now, if I write this down, this is x squared plus y squared plus, now we have shifted it to z minus d squared plus d above z. And that's all in principle we need because now we can start trying to solve this. We can just say, okay, we know this has to be something like that. So let's plug this in. If we were to take this, so let's call this trial and error. That would be trial zero. The most natural thing we would do first by all we know at this point, it has to be a potential of a point charge. So if I take condition two, V has to go to zero for Z to infinity. Now that means Z is much greater than D. So this thing goes really to zero. What about one? Is Z zero at V zero? No, V at Z equals zero is finite. No, I'm left with the D square. So without thinking, just going now through the steps we do, solving a, a differential equation, <clears throat> evaluating the boundary conditions tells us this is not going to work. So to make this work, we have to kind of get rid of this term. And if I call this R plus D here, twiddle, we probably want to subtract this with some r minus d so when we set it to zero we have something like one over d and we subtract them from each other so something like which goes proportional to one over r plus d minus one over r minus d so if i have a d when i reach the boundary condition here at zero Even these two just cancel out. And that will be, as you see, give value at the opposite side. This is, of course, the induced charge, or we call this the mirror charge, which we place on the other side. Then, in principle, we can solve just the problem for two charges at dipole. And it means because
because we are looking at this on the other side. Speed up three two. That's all. Of course, use extensively the method of image charges. Any questions? If not, and see you on Thursday. And again, last uh, reminder, there is an office hour. Shoot me an email that you go there if you have. Okay.